Hello, everybody. Um, let's just start this um, presentation with Patrick Potsky, who's going to be talking about a Bayesian model for identifying hierarchically organized states in neural population activity. Um, this work was done together with Florian Franzen, Giacomo Vassetto, and Jacob Macke at the BCCN and MPI in Tübingen. Um, the question we're interested in is how intrinsic network states influence neural population activity and what role they play on um, information processing. We tackle this kind of problem by building generative models which help us to identify those network states and in turn help us to characterize state-dependent neural responses. And we further argue that the population states can be hierarchically organized and I will use a very simple example to try to show you what I mean by that. So what you see here, oh I can use the mouse, yes, very good. Um, is a, a raster plot of uh, spikes from a population of 200 simulated neurons in a trial of five second length. And on top you see the population rate, which is the sum of spikes across all neurons within one time point. And what one could argue now from this plot is that the population alternates between two discrete states, which is an upstate in which the spike rates are very high and the downstate in which the spike rates are very low. But in fact, what I can tell you since this is a simulation is that this population alternates between three discrete states. And, but this is not observable from this raw population data. Um, I will now uh, reshuffle the neurons in the raster plot to visualize the three st states more easily. So what you can see now is that what I previously called the upstate is actually divided into two one state in which the top half of the population is very active and the bottom half is not, and another state in which is the other way around. And we say that this type of behavior gives rise to hierarchically organized states according to their temporal structure. Um, and you can see it here. Um, the red and the orange state alternate within what, what I previously called the upstate, and the hierarchical organization is shown on the left. Okay. And what we're interested in is to develop statistical methods which enable us to identify those uh, states from real data and in turn enable us to do this kind of reshuffling as we've done here. Okay, so we propose a generative model which uh, is based on a first order hidden Markov model with input dependent uh, transition probabilities which can be hierarchically decomposed and GLM observations. And in our paper, we derive Bayesian inference methods for this type of model and evaluate our methods on V1 population data uh, recorded from a macaque. Uh, yeah, if you're interested in our work, I would be very happy to talk to you in front of my poster with the ID 49. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Up next, we have Lars Busing talking about cluster factor analysis for multineural spiky data. Hi, this is joint work with uh, Timothy Machado, John Cunningham, and Liam Paninski from Columbia University. So uh, in, in neuroscience, um, complex neural circuits are often kind of conceptualized or abstracted away as consisting of a small number of clusters of highly similar neurons. And one model system where this is actually a pretty good uh, approximation to the ground truth and in which we were uh, particularly interested is, is the mammalian and spinal cord. And amongst other things, it consists of these disjoint pools of motor neurons which project to different muscles, and those are plotted here in these color plots. Uh, and in order to study those uh, motor neuron pools, we recorded from them using calcium imaging, um, giving us uh, data for multiple neurons over time. Um, unfortunately, however, the cell labels uh, indicating which um, neuron, uh, uh, which pool the neurons belong to are often not observed. So in order to address this issue, we um, propose a method for unsupervised identification of these, um, of these pools or clusters of, of neurons. Um, based on a latent variable model. Um, and basically what we do is, uh, on the neuron axis, we, we model the data as a mixture of factor analyzer model to capture the different clusters of neurons. And on the uh, time axis, we capture the dynamics in this data by putting a state space model or a dynamic system model over these unobserved latent factors, capturing hopefully these um, um, complex periodic activity patterns that we found. And if we apply this method to our uh, data, we find basically that it gives 
uh, really high uh, quality clusters, which we could very, uh, validate with external covariates in this uh, specific data set. Um, our model does uh, dimensionality reduction on each cluster, giving us um, kind of concise summary statistics to, this, to see what's going on. And last but not least, the state space model part of the model um, basically captures putative um, uh, interaction mechanisms between these different pools, um, hopefully giving us more insight in how, how these different clusters of pools of neurons interact to um, generate these uh, activity dynamics. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lars. Um, up next, we're going to have Kirmel Stackenfeld talking about design principles of the hippocampal cognitive map. Good afternoon. I'm Kim Stackenfeld, and my co-authors on this work are Matt Botvinnik and Sam Gershman. It has been known for a while that there exist cells in the brain that fire selectively for particular locations. Place cells are found in the hippocampus and fire when an animal is near a particular location in space. A sample receptive field is shown to the left, where the black lines mark the trajectory of the animal and the red dots mark the locations of the cells firing. A grid field is shown to the right. These fire periodically um, with respect to space and are found in the nearby region of entorhinal cortex. Traditional approaches has, have sought to determine the underlying mechanism that gives rise to place cells and grid cells. While a relatively neglected approach has been the upstream role of these representations. As such, we approach the, pers uh, the subject from the perspective of how these spatial representations are useful in the context of the problems faced by animals. This problem is that of maximizing reward in a world of unknowns, or the reinforcement learning problem. An animal's goal should be to develop a policy that, uh, to maximize va uh, value, or future expected reward. And the animal should therefore represent space so as to easily compute value. An optimally cheap and flexible statistic to maintain is therefore the expected number of times the animal will visit each future location in space, or a successor representation, which we hypothesize is encoded by place cells. We show how this idea can account for a variety of experimental findings, uh, and as is shown by these examples below, and point to testable predictions. Furthermore, the eigen decomposition of this place field map strongly resembles entorhinal grid cells, as shown in the top left figure. Drawing on ideas from spectral graph theory, we show that these eigenvectors are sensitive to the structure of the transition uh, manifold, and in particular to communities in the transition structure. For this reason, grid fields are sensitive to compartments in the environment, and can even be used to hierarchically segment the enclosure along natural boundaries. Grid cell representations therefore naturally support hierarchical reinforcement learning by providing natural subgoals. In summary, we demonstrate how optimizing spatial representations for reinforcement learning causes place and grid fields to emerge naturally with relatively few parameters. Thank you, and please check out our poster, number 73, this evening. Thank you very much, Kimberly. Um, our next speaker is not here, Alison Fletcher. So um, we're going to continue with Ferran Diego Andilla, who's going to be talking about sparse space-time deconvolution for calcium image analysis. Tonight, I would like to present a framework that will help experimentalists to analyze or conduct automatic analysis of calcium imaging. But the main concern, or the main thing is, what is calcium imaging? Calcium imaging is an emerging technique that allows them to record the activity of the, the functional activity of the brain in multiple areas, and then that means that they can monitor a large population of neural activity of hundreds of thousands of new cells at single cell resolution. The main goal of this work is that given a calcium image data, we want to estimate the locations of cells and the activity when these neurons are firing, and also we would like to have like the cell, we want to learn the cell appearance and also the typical impulse response that are underlying on this data. In order to achieve this, we propose a unified formulation between matrix factorization and convolutional sparse coding in terms of a single optimization program that exploits the known structure of the data and then we can produce the spatial representation of this kind of data. The idea is that on the image, we can 
is how we are conducting the, the joint formulation. And, then, and the idea is that we represent every spatial temporal, spatial component and temporal component into a convolution of sparse coding. The idea is that the main formulation is that we want to approximate the volume data to D plus time into a summation of K latent signals, one dimensional signals that represents that we want to, where one of these, every special component, we want to infer single and unique cells that, and also at the same time, we want to infer a set of spike trains that helps given some input response that we learn. And we compare with the state of the art algorithms in inferring spike frames or semantic cells, and we perform as comparison to comparable results. And if you are more interested in this process, I will see you, I hope to see you tonight. Thank you very much. Okay, finally, our last presentation is gonna be Christina Sabine, um, talking about spatial temporal representations of uncertainty in spiking neural networks. And this is joint work with Sophie Deneuve at NS Paris. Um, one fundamental challenge for Bayesian uh, approaches trying to understand computation in the brain is to figure out how probability distributions are represented at the level of neural activity. And there are two main classes of models for doing this. The first class, the spatial codes, distribute information about the probability distributions across cells, such that the activity of individual neurons encodes values of the underlying random variables. Alternatively, temporal codes assume a one-to-one -one map between features and the neurons, and the dynamics of the population implement some form of MCMC sampling. Each of these representations have both advantages and disadvantages. The spatial codes can be read out relatively fast, but they are uh, prohibitive in the number of neurons that are required in order to represent multidimensional probability distributions. Uh, in contrast, the temporal codes are really fast, uh, are really good in terms of the number of resources, but this comes at the price of the time required in order to collect the samples. What we propose here is a third class of models that try to combine the best of both worlds by constructing a spatial temporal code. And what this enables us is to have a linear trade-off between the uh, time required for uh, representing the distribution and the number of neurons. Okay, so, okay, sorry about that. Okay. So the key idea is simple. We, we need to formally separate what is the computation performed in the circuit from the way this computation is represented at the level of neural activity. So for us, the con computation continues to be sampling-based approximate Bayesian inference, but we relax the assumption of a one-to-one -one map between neurons and features. Instead, we assume that we have a linear um, decoder that maps neural responses <laughs> uh, into features, and given this linear decoder, we derive the optimal neural dynamics that encode the target MCMC sampler. Now, why is this interesting? So, uh, such a representation inherits all the computational benefits of a sampling-based representation, to which it has, adds robustness to neural damage and a substantial increase in speed. In particular, it allows the network to encode simultaneously several independent MCMC chains. Now, from a biological perspective, this kind of model is able to capture a range of experimental data in terms of single neuron and pair of neuron properties and the way they are modulated by uncertainty. However, because it is a distributed code, this means that the activity of individual neurons doesn't obviously relate to, uh, to the underlying computation performed by the network. Instead, such a model argues for new prob um, population level analysis for probing uh, probabilistic computation at the level of experimental data. And if you want to find out the details, please come to poster 43. So luckily we found our lost speaker, and she's now here. And let's welcome Alison Fletcher, who's gonna be talking about the scalable inference for neural connectivity uh, from calcium imaging. Sorry. Um, 
Okay, so this is joint work with my co-author, Sandy Brungan at NYU Poly. Um, one of the core problems in neuroscience is to reconstruct the synaptic connections between networks of neurons. Um, we address this connectivity problem with calcium imaging. Um, and calcium imaging is a relatively new technology that allows observations of populations of neurons um, via optical measurements instead of electrical measurements. So basically, neurons are um, modified so that they fluoresce when they spike. And this modification is done by either optically, by either optogenetically transfecting them with a calcium indicator or loading them with calcium sensitive dyes. So then one can actually just, you know, actually take the population of neurons, look at that area of neurons, um, stimulate it with light, and then actually measure the, the, spi the, the flashes of images. So you measure the resultant emitting images to light to actually get the spiking potentials for that class of neurons. And this is a very powerful technology because you can monitor hundreds to a thousand neurons in parallel. Um, you can do it in vivo and you can do it in vitro. Um, you can actually look at cortical neurons at different depths with a two photon mi microscope so you can penetrate different depths and monitor that there. So then one could take these actual statistical connections between these observations of the fluorescences and figure out and infer the connectivity pattern. So there are tremendous challenges in inferring connectivity from calcium imaging. So first of all, it's a very, very indirect system. You're actually getting these fluorescent traces, which are more like blurred movies. They're not action potentials. So, and you know, additionally, spiking is actually not even that associated with um, synaptic connections. So there's also a lot of nonlinear dynamics. The neuron itself is a nonlinear dynamical system. The calcium imaging cell and fluorescence processes are non involve nonlinear dynamical systems. We have, of course, very large neuronal data sets. We have a number of hidden inputs. We have exogenous inputs. We have external stimuli we can't model. Um, probably the most significant challenge for this problem, though, is that there's a heavy temporal blurring. So if you look at the um, graph to the left there, the early researchers, so this is a 2003 is early for calcium imaging. Um, early researchers glutamate induced spiking, and there are a number of spikes over 100 milliseconds. But if you look at the calcium fluorescence above there, and you look at the decay rate of that, it's over a few seconds. So we have this heavy temporal deblurring um, you know, that, you, that you'd have to be doing. And that would be okay if you were looking for an average rate of spiking. But we're actually trying to do connectivity, so we need a precise timing for interneuronal causality. Um, oh, I'm almost done. Sorry. Um, it also has a very low frame rate, so the frames are at an order of magnitude um, slower than, than the interneuronal inter dynamics, so we need a super resolution, so I took three sentences. So our main contribution is a scalable, systematic algorithm to infer connectivity. It combines graphical models with the expectation um, framework, and we did it on cortical neurons and come to poster 70 and hear more about it. Thanks. Thank you very much, and please let's thank all of our speakers again.